Right, and we address, we talk a lot about in the paper, these are, so there are like three lenses that we look at. It's like the valuation lens, the process lens, and the power lens when we are negotiating trade-offs between conservation and development. And who gets to be on the table is part of the process side of it, like the governance approach. Like, if we are much more uh, deliberative and open-ended and participatory in approach, uh, then uh, we invite uh, a lot of the stakeholders and typically follow like a snowfall, uh, sorry, the snow, snowball. snowballing uh, approach, sampling approach where you bring in people and talk to them and ask them who are the other important stakeholders and you do that like to two or three degrees and then typically you have covered. But even then, uh, some of the people like Pete Grossius who are on the, our power ex experts, uh, they say that um, even then there would be invisible powers who would not be on the table. So definitely, I think that process challenge is huge in terms of applying MCDA in field setting. And another side to that that we faced was uh, the language translation issues, um, because a lot of these, when we had the, they, these were conducted with on uh, real-time translation, so they had people who were uh, communicating between different languages. Uh, so we had those uh, headphones on, and so I mean that's really a big challenge in terms of uh, even we have if we have the people who are representing the local communities, given the like if you have like the people representing international and national government at the, on the same table as the local people, so they have issues in talking out or speaking out what they want to say. So those are some of the disadvantages in the group setting as well. So first of all, the challenge is to bring them on the table, some of these disadvantaged stakeholders, especially these people who were evicted, and then to have them, pr uh, provide them an atmosphere where they can really speak out their mind, uh, that's another challenge. So I mean, those are very significant process challenges that we face on the field. Of course, that's... And so, you know, your, your results, I mean, it's pretty interesting that it shows the international community is more in favor of conservation. This is less well off for others. And the implication is that, well, you could have some payments for <coughs> services that would, you know, the international community therefore pay for what it gets. But given all your uh, incommensurable values, I mean, to what extent, how effective do you think PES schemes could be? And do you think they would be, I mean, because monetary transfers obviously is just going to address one type of value. I mean, in... And I was thinking about the multi-use. Do you think that the PES schemes could essentially fund more sustainable practices for multi-use, or have you given much thought to that? Yes, that's basically the direction that we are headed yeah. right now. I mean, as you know, I mean, I've been kind of really interested in red uh, mechanism, and that red is like one form of payment for ecosystem from the global to the local community. And uh, we've been paying very close attention to the <coughs> red as it's been negotiated in Copenhagen and Cancun conferences. And uh, I'm presenting a paper, which is much more technical paper on the red design in the Earth System Governance Meeting in Colorado uh, in May. And uh, that paper basically is looking at some of these questions, like how can we best figure out the mechanisms um, that transfer that global uh, wealth to the local level. The, one of the counterintuitive challenges here is that if, if the money is given to these local people, they are going to develop it. So, the, 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 I mean, that's what the anthropologists on our team are arguing, is that if we give them money, they, they will tend to do something with that. So, giving, as opposed to giving them money directly to do something, or even like uh, uh, thinking about building some kind of capacity at the local level, um, the, the challenge is, as you said, that how can we really transfer the money or even some kind of non-monetary benefits in the, in the form of technical support or whatever, um, that at the same time is uh, able to maintain the, 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 the conservation and make these people um, kind of like, in a way, stable with, in, in, in part of that habitat in a way that is not too destructive. And that challenge is really huge. And uh, I think uh, uh, that's one of the key questions that we're proposing to be explored in the follow-up uh, to, to this grant to MacArthur Foundation as well. But the issues, as you described them, sound you know, a million years old. I mean, 
eminent domain. Uh, I'm thinking of a particular barn up near Madison, Wisconsin, which has one corner cut off because of Interstate 94. Uh, this idea that local folks have different goals than folks elsewhere is no surprise. Grand Canyon dams, uh, three gorges, whatever, and typically local folks want the money. Mm -hmm. They don't want the other stuff. Uh, so you still have left undone, and it's not your fault, uh, the final negotiation about how this happens. And you also said, I think, at the beginning that you, you weren't really dealing with global stuff, but of course the example that comes up immediately in my mind is, is carbon management and uh, global warming, which yeah. is sort of the ultimate uh, conflict between a global view and a local view. Right. And both of these issues are, I mean, I, I completely agree. Um, the, so this is not something new finding in terms of the politics of scale side of it. What is new is that historically it's been looked at from the development angle. We are looking at it from the conservation side of it. Is that even if we pursue uh, uh, pure conservation strategies, uh, that would have politics of scale effects. So if traditionally it has been looked at like the gorgeous, three gorgeous dam or um, uh, intro-oceanic highway in Amazon, uh, those have been looked at as um, from the development angle, like uh, like Piglet or Face is what, uh, or some of these other works that I cite. And in terms of carbon management, definitely that's the red mechanism uh, that's been, uh, you know, it's been very controversial since Conference of Parties meetings, uh, because uh, deforestation is one of the most wicked, complex challenges that we have. I was reviewing one paper uh, that uh, listed more than 100 causes of deforestation. I mean, and, and they said that they cannot even prioritize them because if they are like, you, you name it, 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 it could be uh, not just agricultural production, it could be a lot of other factors as well. So, of course, issues are old, but um, the, the, the challenge is, in this case, we are learning more and more that if we want to conserve these biodiversity hotspots, there will have to be some kind of co-management from between the global and national and the local community, it cannot be done at one scale taken alone. We have to have some kind of co-management across the scales mm -hmm. and balance of value transfer uh, some way, some way there, there needs to be some kind of mechanism. And uh, just one final comment is that I completely agree with Josh's point is that just calculating these balance, uh, sorry, payments for ecosystem services just for the carbon uh, it's not going to be enough. We'll have to think of more ho uh, holistic function where we calculate more synergistic function uh, in terms of value transfer. Not like that would include like water uh, and carbon and some of these other ecosystem services. So I think it will have to be more. And I, I'm actually taking a little bit step further. It's like also protecting spiritual values and some of these other aspects that are not directly included in the ecosystem services. Yeah, yeah. And the local government said that they had paid adequate compensation. Therefore, they have no further responsibility to pay them anything. Yeah. Um, PDS or whatever. So the so the things that they wanted were not could not be you know compensated by money. Um, and you pointed out these spiritual values. So um, in the end, they, don't they make like China? Just I always think of the Three Gorges Dam, and they make a utilitarian decision: the greatest good for the greatest number. <clears throat> well, we had to move a million people. Well, but but you know, 300 million people be benefited from the electricity. So so in the end, those are the kind of decisions that are made uh, at the expense uh, of the local people. Um, so doesn't it come down to basically uh, a matter of political power at, in the end? That you know, in, okay. in terms of decision. I'm really glad that you asked this question because um, the, the the power question is really the big puzzle. And uh, uh, and that's why I call it like the politics of scale because there's, it's like the power differential across different scales that we're talking about. But the power is also the, in in Africa. The power is really a big challenge. I mean, when we went to Tanzania, and our local team there, who were who were professors in Sokoina University in political science and sociology. All they were talking about was colonization of Africa by Europeans. And they said that they are still, uh, even though the, the, the Europeans have left, they're still uh, living under the, those institutions that were set up as part of that colonization process. So the national government that inherited 
that the post-colonial national governments in Tanzania, they say have been corrupt, they have, the, they have a lot of governance issues there. So when we talk about these compensation mechanisms, when uh, you know, like they have been managing these massive wildlife uh, um, and some of these other areas, which are not necessarily national parks, but they are adjacent to these wildlife management areas, um, they, they, it, it's really a big challenge to um, just communicate to these national politicians and decision makers uh, about um, the concerns that the local communities have. Uh, in in the face of these well, why do they uh, even care? Top down. No, why do they even care if they if it's going to benefit a larger number of people? Why would they care about seven hundred people if it's going to benefit the larger community? Why, I mean, why would they even consider the, the concerns of the local people? Right. It, 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 that's that's basically the challenge. Is uh, from the the problem is that if you ignore the local people's concerns. Uh, then we are stuck with the business as usual. I mean, the, the, the national, park, national parks have been set up in Africa, but they are not working in terms of protecting the biodiversity. So, In other words, because the local people who are displaced are coming in and poaching? Or, or they, then they get disenchanted. They, 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 and they're part of the habitat as well. The people who are brought in from outside to manage those parks, they, they are probably more corrupt. Than the local people who are. Because I think of the ivory, you know, the ivory one. The right. They had ivory, it didn't work. When they let people harvest sustainably, then it worked. So right. it was, it was that, maybe that's what you're talking about. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, 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 there, are lo there is a lot of history that I'm talking about in terms of the power uh, processes that these local communities have gone through, at least in Africa. And they, and they remember that history when we talk to them. And the problem is that. Um, the, the, it's because of that history that these business as usual scenarios of just maintaining national parks or uh, imposing national parks on these people is not helping in terms of protection of biodiversity. The, 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 the loss of the bio, biodiversity protection uh, rate, I mean, is, is, is in, I mean the, if you look at, for example, some of the studies that have been done at the continental scale in the last 20 years, clearly, we see that, that, that that's happening. There was a big study that came out of uh, UNEP in 2005, 2006, they looked at the last 20 years of data. Uh, there was a Columbia study that came out um, in 2008. They, so in the, both of the studies have looked at very closely in three continents, and uh, they in, in Latin America, in Africa, in uh, Southeast Asia, in Indonesia, and Malaysia region. And they have clearly pointed out that these national park management options is not working out. So the reason is they basically, the local people ignore the boundary and go ahead and develop and harvest in there anyway, and that wrecks right. any other protection. They, there are enforcement the issues. There are a lot of those places. They know who lives where. They, they can even talk with birds. They, I mean, they are just amazing <laughs> people. I mean, I just have, uh, that was an in, in, uh, interesting experience <laughs> to, to. So you're saying now they have to take into account the local concerns, even I think, I think without, in, I mean, so it's not just the, the utilitarian perspective, as you mentioned, it's that has been the, the, the larger driver of decision making, at least at the national stage, but that's not working. So the challenge is, if we pan out this biodiversity loss rate to the next 100 years, I mean, Europe has lost biodiversity. What, whatever we have is secondary growth here. In Europe, in in US, we have probably very few primary forest uh, forests left. They are mostly secondary growth here. So, in Africa, we still have primary forests. In in Latin in Latin America and Peru, uh, Amazon, we still have some primary forests. Once we lose them, probably we can grow biofuels, or we can grow these uh, you know like other kinds of uh, uh, trees uh, that can provide us some economic value, but whether we would have the same uh, diverse web of life there, again, as the way we have now, and whether, whether that's an irreversible thing or reversible thing, that's the largest uncertainty that we face. And what would happen to the larger hydrological cycle of the planet or the carbon cycle of the planet after we lose these primary forests, those are also some very large uncertainties that we face. So the question is that whether we just 
keep on going the way we are now in terms of uh, trying to protect these biodiversity hotspots through these management options that are not working, or do we change? So the question is, at least we say that the current management option is not working. We need to change. Now the question is, what kind of change do we do? Uh, that's, that's a question of discussion. But at least we want, we're saying is that we need to have local people on board for, if we want to make any important decisions, we need to bring them on the table and engage them in a way which is uh, respectful, which, which is humbling, uh, which gives them space on the table, and we listen to them uh, authentically. Yes. I think that statement from the government was like says it all. We paid adequate compensation. Yeah. Done. Yeah. No. It's all problem solved. Right. <laughs> that's, that's that's purely neoclassical. We gave them financial compensation. You know, even though their main concerns were not financial. You know, that says sums it up. So I, I have a I have a method uh, question. Sure. Uh, can can you just elaborate, give me a little more information on how these weights are developed, you know, across ecosystem services, social equality, and so on? Is that through direct questioning, and then you simply tabulating or uh, summarizing the weights, or are they imputed in this technique? I, I, right. I'm not quite sure. If you could just give me a right. So those are through the direct questions. They're direct questions. Yeah. So if you if uh, if we see the paper, uh, so we have them. Uh, the, the the those direct questions are in there. <coughs> what happens is that the respondents are asked to assign. First, there is a lot of background work that's done, right? I mean, there's a lot of deliberation over uh, multiple days that goes on, and we explain them is that. Uh, for the weights, they have to assign like weight from 0% to 100% for each value dimension so that the total adds up to 100%. But what we do is like, first they assign weights on these values that were agreed upon in the group on the left side. Those are like the economic welfare, good governance, social cultural values, right. social equity. So first they assign weights on them and then they break them down along these three special scales. The respondents are doing this. Respondents are doing this, okay. right. So they do them at individual level. They have those forms in front of them. They do them. And then when we bring them to the group, we put them like in a groups of like three or four people. Yes. And then they discuss and develop a group level weighting scheme. Okay, so you can aggregate it up. Yeah. The, the reason I'm asking this question is because did, did uh, you, your co-authors, <coughs> consider an alternative way um, such as conjoint analysis? Right to figure out the kinds of trade-offs that people might be making? I mean, definitely, I think, like, uh, triangulating different methodologies yeah. helps. So if we are, if the Tanzanian government in the phase two of this project asks us to go back and replicate this and, and methodology, I'm definitely planning to triangulate, not just using constant sum weights, rather uh, conjoint analysis, right. and there are a couple of other methodologies as well where we can kind of, like, um, the, 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 there are a lot of timing issues, there are a lot of other issues that we want to take care of. So, um, the, you know, and then the process issues, like who is on the table. So, I, I think those those are really important issues. I mean, I'm not sure that it would make a difference. Uh, yeah. It's just that, you know, conjoint is so ideally suited to addressing this issue of trade-offs. Because yeah. the respondent, the subject, has to reveal his hand. Right? Yeah. That they have to rank things from one to whatever. Yeah. And so you, you are able to truly impute yes. what's going on in that in that. I've done a conjoint analysis study with the California yeah. Energy Commission on solar panels, basically, like how much a household is willing to pay to install solar panels on their house, retrofits. Right. And uh, we, right. We, we were really able to figure out those trade off yeah. weighting functions um, in that case. So I'm, I'm convinced, yeah. <laughs> but in this yeah. case we didn't yeah. do it because yeah. I'm just uh, curious. Yeah. yeah, I mean they, they were it was just a timing thing, and you know like we had limited time, and you know everybody's time is valuable. Sure. We have people like <laughs> international and national stakeholders there, um, and uh, so in the field settings you have to move pretty fast. Yeah. So the constants and methodologies advantage is that it it's easily also communicable to the local people. Uh, they can understand it. We tell them like the pennies or whatever. Like they, they know that okay. Right. That it it makes like it's intuitive. So 
but I understand that there are a lot of biases with it as well. There are, there are timing issues that uh, can change people's uh, weights depending on what's offered first, you know, right? So, so those are some of the issues that we have to be very careful in terms of interpreting the data. Thank you. I'm curious about the overlaps that may exist in the values. You, you briefly alluded to yeah. ecosystem serves and the biodiversity and how you ended up separating those out. And I'm actually also looking at good governance and social equity because good governance is related to social equity. And I was wondering how you, what, what made you decide to break the values into what they are and how you decided to really define yeah. or constrain them? It took about eight hours of discussion. <laughs> so it's a... Uh, uh, we, there were some people, as I mentioned earlier, on, who wanted to keep biodiversity protection as part of the ecosystem services, and then there were others. Ecologists were arguing for that. Biologists were saying, no, <laughs> we want to keep them separate. That was one key dividing line among the disciplines, but also there was a uh, di dividing line among people just had different perceptions. Um, the governance there, as I mentioned, they have a lot of corruption issues there. So they, they were thinking about governance more from the corruption and participation as opposed to equity. So they wanted to treat equity as a separate problem <coughs> as opposed to uh, the governance, even though social equity could be part of the governance. But they were thinking of governance more from the perspective of uh, like uh, having less corruption, more participation of the local people, and equity was more like access to the resources, more like uh, availability of resources for the local people. But I. Well, one final thing, I mean, the, the, if we, in, in theory, if we want to apply multiple criteria analysis, uh, all the values should be mutually excludable. And if they're not mutually exclusive, then there are problems. So uh, that's, uh, that's one of the, one of the mm -hmm. problems that are well known in MCDA literature. And uh, it's always a challenge how you kind of like apply that in these three settings. And that problem doesn't go away with conjoint either. It's, it, right. That's, 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 the, I mean, that, that's the problem with any, if you want to even construct uh, any expected utility function, even in classical economics, that's like, uh, the problem is like, how do you define what gets into your utility function? Right. People don't, I mean, there's an ambiguity there that we don't know. Thank you very much, Lon. Thank you.